Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the uh, stereoscopic displays and applications. And uh, well, the the first session is the stereoscopic developments, and uh, we have four papers. So the first uh, speaker is Dr. Benjamin Bacchus from the Vivid Vision Inc. And the title of his talk is uh, Use of VR to Assess and Treat Weakness in Human Stereoscopic Vision. So if you're ready, please. Thank you. And could I see the display for the, the time, time remaining? Wonderful, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, so this is work I've done with my uh, new colleagues um, here at a company called Vivid Vision. I'm gonna be talking about um, not how to do stereo displays, but about the problem of people who don't have stereo. I'm sure all of you have friends or family members for whom the stereo experience that you're familiar with just doesn't happen. And um, so I'd like to talk about what can be done for these people, whether it's actually important to do anything for them, and then show you how um, this company I've joined four months ago is working on the problem. Um, and I'll zip through this. I've come from academics. I've, I've been a professor these last 17 years, and um, now I'm having a lot of fun working as a chief science officer. It's, really, it's a really fun job. So here's the problem. Uh, stereoscopic depth perception is actually used by humans for a lot of things. It's not just fun. It's for guiding your hand and foot movements. If you've ever walked around with just one eye, um, you'll know that you'll, you'll step off of steps. It's difficult to reach things. You'll overfill coffee cups. It takes a long time to get used to monocular vision if you've had stereo. It's for navigation through the environment. People who have stereo vision are better at parallel parking. It lets you instantly appreciate um, 3D layouts of the world. And that's because binocular disparities are processed in parallel. You measure binocular disparities at every part of the visual field simultaneously. One consequence of that is that without stereo vision, you have to allocate spatial attention to central vision in order to use depth cues. So the world is rich with depth cues. There are other ways to see depth besides stereo, but they take a lot of attention. And if you don't have stereo to process depth in parallel throughout the visual field, you have to concentrate on the things you're looking at to see which thing is in front of the other um, there'll be occlusion cues, there will be a motion parallax cue, shadow cues, but you have to use visual attention to extract that information, and it leads to tunnel vision. There's also detecting near objects, and near objects will attract attention. They are salient. A thing with what we would call a crossed disparity, because it's near, will draw your attention to it as a result of its salience. And that's one reason why people without good binocular vision are more likely to lose an eye. So something, a projectile will come and hit them in the eye or something. <clears throat> so stereo um, perception is useful. It is true the world is full of depth cues, but people who do have stereo rely on it. And the reason is because it's so useful. In fact, it's more useful than scientists have long thought. Why did scientists think it was not useful? Um, most of you are convinced that stereo is not only cool and fun, but probably useful. Um, well, the th thinking was that stereo is very slow, and so it must not be useful. That turned out um, to be an artifact of the use of random dot stereograms. So it's actually very fast if you use a realistic display, and this is work that um, comes out of my own lab. The problem is that random dot stereograms take seconds to see because of Q combination. If you have a Bayesian system, an optimal system for extracting depth, 
then that system is going to say there's no depth edge here. I can tell from the unbroken texture. So when I say it's a Q conflict stimulus, if you can cross fuse, you'll see the square popping out in depth. But if you look at this with just one eye, texture is telling you there's no depth. That's a very powerful depth cue, and your brain takes time to resolve that conflict. So in fact, this, this report that stereo is very slow actually was a report about the time to resolve conflicting cues, not how fast you are to see depth from disparity when it does not conflict, which is the case in most natural scenes. So in fact, stereo could be very useful. However, about 10% of the population is stereo deficient. They're either stereo blind, seeing no stereo depth at all, or they're unable to see small disparities um, as depths. Causes of stereo deficiency, about 3 to 4% of the population has strabismus, where the eyes are either crossed or uncrossed. About 3 to 4% has amblyopia, and a lot of them also have strabismus. Amblyopia is when you have um, lazy eye, inability to see clearly out of one eye. That's what kids wear an eye patch for when they are um, uh, an infant, is you cover the good eye to make them use the other eye that's not seeing well. Convergence insufficiency, if you don't cross your eyes enough, then you won't be able to measure binocular disparities well, because the images fall on non-corresponding parts of the two retinas. Optical deficits that cause form deprivation in one or both eyes, such as um, cataract. And then developmental anomalies, such as albinism. A person who um, is albino does not have a decu often does not have a decusating optic chiasm. And so that they will send um, information from one eye to one hemisphere and the other eye to the other hemisphere, rather than sending everything from the left visual field to the left hemisphere and everything from the right visual field to the right hemisphere, or uh, right retina, left visual field to the right hemisphere. Um, it's complex. There are lots of things that have to go right for you to have binocular vision. Clearly, this was a valuable system in primates because all of these things have gone right and a tremendous amount of neural hardware is dedicated to binocular vision. What has to go right? Well, you have to have the eyes looking in the same direction uh, so that the same image falls on corresponding parts of the two retinas, and that means no large strabismus. Um, here's a woman with strabismus, and after surgery, there's at least cosmetic correction, but usually you don't get the eyes aligned within a degree of visual angle. The eyes, the eyes have to be aligned. Um, usually your eyes are aligned within about half a degree of visual angle. So if this eye and this eye are both, if I'm trying to look at that exit sign with both eyes, one of them will only be deviated by about half a degree at most. And um, surgical procedures will make you look good if you get it within about five degrees, and that's often considered success. You can't have good stereo vision if you still have five degrees of misalignment in the, in the uh, binocular system. Um, you can't be completely suppressing the output from either eye. This is often misunderstood. A healthy visual system will suppress information. That's good. In fact, it's what lets you look through your hand if you put your hand in front of one eye. So you want correct use of suppression, but if you're always suppressing one eye, the information doesn't get to the brain, and you can't combine it with information from the other eye to see in stereo. You need good optical images in both eyes. No occlusion from cataract or other things. Um, and you also don't want what's called anisometropia. This is an, um, a, a, a term that's used in optometry and ophthalmology. An, not, iso, the same, measurement of vision. So it's not having the same focus power. The most common cause of binocular vision problems is unilateral, meaning one eye, hyperopia, which is being farsighted. So if a child is farsighted in one eye, 
It's a very common cause, both of strabismus and lack of stereo vision. And it's quite, it's quite common to be farsighted in just one eye. So all these things um, have to happen correctly during the first two years of life for stereo vision to develop normally. However, stereo deficiency can be treated even in adults if the neural hardware is in place. Um, we don't know what the incidence is of untreatable binocular vision due to neural hardware problems. I'm calling it hardware, but the, the, the synapses have to be um, there to be remolded um, between the neurons and the visual system. Recovery of stereo depth perception, even in adults, is now firmly established. And there are a number of labs around the world that are um, producing data to show this is true. And um, here's data from my own lab. Um, this is a composite score with two different training regimes. On the x-axis is how good the person was from um, uh, very good to very poor at the start of training, and the y-axis is the um, relative improvement in the ability to see depth. For two different training regimes, this is an interesting condition. In this condition, we reduced the contrast of the input to the good eye. These were all people who had amblyopia, so they had um, a tendency to suppress one eye, the eye that was amblyopic, and we reduced the contrast and made it mixed so that the two eyes received different strengths in order to equalize the input to cortex. And what these data show is that there was an improvement in the group that was trained using these um, adjusted stimuli to equalize the input to cortex, but not with stimuli that had the same contrast, presumably because people continued to suppress their amblyopic eye. So the approach we're taking at the company, Vivid Vision, is to target these specific subsystems, because if any one of them is um, wrong or not working properly, you will not be able to recover stereoscopic vision. They're all necessary, and they, any one of them can be the, the weak, link, weak link in a given individual. So the first would be control of the virgin's eye posture, your ability to um, successfully cross your eyes when you're looking at something near, the regulation of interocular suppression. And this is one of the greatest success stories of the last 15 years, is training people not to suppress one eye so that input can get to the brain from both eyes at the same time. It's not sufficient. There are lots of studies showing that um, you can treat suppression, and many of them found no benefit in stereo. So it's not enough to treat suppression in many people, but in some it is. In some people it is. Some people instantly get good stereo vision as soon as you treat their suppression. Extraction of binocular disparity despite residual binocular misalignment. When you change your vergence distance from something far to something near, your brain can detect that there's a cross disparity here it's a crude cross disparity, but you know you have to cross your eyes to get here. And so this ability to measure a disparity, despite not being already binocularly fixated on an object, is very important. And then finally, what we would call the utilization of the disparity. Let's say your brain has measured the disparity. You're not done. You have to use it. You have to have the circuitry in place to estimate depth, adjust your convergence eye posture, and properly combine stereo with monocular depth cues. What we're doing in the company is using um, consumer VR hardware and neuroplasticity um, to measure and treat these um, disorders. We're taking advantage of the fact that lack of stereo is usually a perceptual problem, not an eye problem. We're using 
inexpensive head-mounted displays. This is more than adequate. Consumer-grade headsets are more than adequate uh, for doing the training that we want to do. These are lovely because you have separate control of the left and right eyes. So that's perfectly what you would need to do this training. Uh, and we put it into a package. And um, there are a lot, of, a lot of kids who just won't wear an eye patch, but they will play video games. So the key is to make the gaming really fun. And when you do that, you get very good compliance. And there are many parents who don't want to have surgery for their children. We, we don't know how many kids actually will need surgery anyways. Um, some of them will. But um, perhaps some of those kids can be treated without surgery or at least have better outcomes for stereo vision by doing sensory training in these displays before and after the surgery. And here's a little demo, just a, like a representation of what you might see in a head-mounted display. And you can see some objects are monocularly present. This spaceship is only visible in one eye, and the symbol here is visible in the other. So to see both, you can't be suppressing either eye to play the game. And I'm going to zip through, to leave time for questions, I'm going to zip through um, this data from a pilot study. The change from the dark bars to the light bars shows an improvement in stereo acuity, um, the ability to see small depth. In, a, in an early study that was done using the system. Yay. And um, I want to call your attention to a demo tomorrow night. Um, come by and we'll show you the head-mounted displays and you can play our uh, stereo games and see how they work. Thank you very much.